So hopefully, some of you have a little bit of Tina Turner grooving in the background as you entertain the notion of this question. But I'll add to this question that it stems from a lie. A lie that we have all been sold. That in order to attain fulfillment, in order to experience happiness, we need to achieve lofty goals. And in order to achieve those goals, we need to work really, really hard. We need to commit ourselves. We need to sacrifice. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to endure. And we need to do all of that in a competitive environment where it's you against them. And in that environment, if you're going to succeed, if you're going to win at all costs, you have to have the competitive edge. And what will help you have that competitive edge is if you demonize your competition, if you make them the enemy. Because then it makes it easier to beat them down and be the victor. When I was a young boy, I bought that lie, hook, line, and sinker. At the time, I was 29 years old, which sadly meant I had the emotional intelligence of about a 20, 21-year-old, no offense to the 29-year-olds in here, but let's call a spade a spade, guys. <laughs> and I did what any young man would have done at the time who wanted to make a good first impression and who owned a golden retriever puppy. <laughs> I brought him along. And all the guys in here, you know exactly what I was up to. His name was Ike. He was handsome, irresistible, and yes, Robin, she did not stand a chance. I'm a young guy, obsessed with competition, obsessed with winning. I gotta know. Robin, you got this big race coming up. You gonna win this thing, or what? Now, the male species, <laughs> we're unique at best, right? At best. And one of the things that makes us unique is that we have this one little gene that enables us to produce a thought and then share the thought, almost at the same time. <laughs> without ever running that thought through a filter that determines, is this a good thought? Is this a thought I should be sharing at this particular time? Now, I have this gene. Unfortunately, it's a dominant gene for me. And I know that because I've used it a lot of times, and I've had to stand there and look at the faces of horror. <laughs> and then I think, you know, you're a bit of a sensitive New Age guy, Jace. I mean, just go over there. Be a shoulder for her to cry on when she loses. She's going to need it. Be the gentleman. Be that guy. So I think, okay, I can be that guy. So I get in my car, I get to the ferry, make the ferry to Victoria, arrive at the stadium, find my seat, just in time. Just as the starter calls the runners to the line, runners, to your marks, bang, off they go. At which point, Robin thought it would be a good idea to finally pass somebody. Who knew? I mean, that was okay, right? I mean, the second group could have their own little race, right? It's kind of cute more than anything. <laughs> but then our Robin, she didn't stop there. Uh-uh, she didn't stop. She kept passing more runners, one after the next, after the next, until finally this happened. But instead, because I had just witnessed an amazing display of the human spirit, a willingness to go, hard. And Robin had just done that. A little late, mind you, but, but she still went for it. And in my world, in my competitive world, you see, that was impossible. I had been taught and I believed that you could not take a perspective like hers, go out there and give it your best shot and, perf and combine it with a performance like that. Could never happen. And yet I had just seen it happen with my very own eyes. 
and it challenged everything that I knew to be true about how a real competitor went out to perform, achieve high performance, and succeed. After two races, the first one where we finished second to the Russians, and our second one where we finished second to the Americans, we knew that we were in the hunt. We knew we had the boat speed. All we had to do was go out there in two days and race the way we were capable of, and that gold medal would be mine. And so on the morning of September 25th, 1988, I awoke. And the first thought in my mind was, today I am going to win an Olympic gold medal. You know, I've never met Steve Armitage before. <laughs> He's the CBC commentator there that day. But I'll tell you what, if I ever do, I got a couple of choice words for that guy. <laughs> I mean, whose side was he on anyway? <laughs> Canadians got a lot of water to make up if they're going to get into the medals. <laughs> Not feeling the love, Steve. Oh, what's up? <laughs> you know, but in Steve's defense, <laughs> We didn't give them much to cheer about. And this photograph pretty much captures it. DFL in the final. And at that moment, after the pain of a race like that starts to sweep over you, you dump a bucket load of emotion that says you're a loser on top of that. Whew. I wanted that boat to fill up with water and sink and disappear. I was not prepared to explain that away to anybody. Sitting there reading the article that ex accompanied this photograph, I experienced an emotion I had never, ever experienced in all of my years of competitive sport. And that was shame. I felt ashamed for what we had done. Ashamed to my family, my friends, to the nation, right? We bombed out. And we did bomb out, and I didn't necessarily disagree with the headline. What hurt so much was to be so publicly scolded in front of the entire country. That article was written as if none of us were ever going to read it. You know, what the hell were they thinking? My strategy at the time was to hide. And I figured Australia was as good a place as any. And when I flew down there, I was kind of hoping my emotions, all the ones I was struggling with, were somehow going to miss the flight. But when I got down there, I found out not only did they make the flight, but they brought some friends. Because things continued to snowball down there. Until eventually I arrived at a place where I realized the only way I was ever going to fix that, the only way I could ever undo Seoul, was to go again. Because this time, yeah, I was going to the Olympics to win. That was a given. But I was also going there to find some revenge, to deal up some retribution, and I figured hatred, that is the game. And two months into my training, this method of motivation, poof, working like a charm. Lifting more weights than I had been before we left for Seoul. My fitness was returning. Boat speed was returning. Very excited young man. But three... Four months later, I'm starting to struggle. Physically, still getting stronger, still getting faster. But emotionally, going to this place of hatred and anger two, three times a day, starting to spill over into my very being. And it's affecting the way I treat everybody around me. At the age of 25, I'm becoming a very bitter young man. Until finally, one morning on the way to practice, I almost got hit by a car crossing the road. And in that moment, I thought to myself, oh, if I had just got hit by that car, I could take off some time for training. In that moment, in that thought, I knew my journey was over. You see, Robin ran for a different reason. She ran because it was simply part of her journey. And the motivation that she pulled up came from inside. It was intrinsic motivation. We're actually all hardwired to experience it. We just kind of forget. But in order to have intrinsic motivation, it has to come from a certain place. It has to come from a place of love. You 
You see, Robin loved running. She loved how she felt when she ran fast. And the byproduct of that love, it was impressive. Two Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games silver medalist, World Cup silver medalist, consistently being ranked top 10 in the world for 17 years on the national team. And if you knew anything about the climate of cheating in women's running during the 80s and 90s, that's an unbelievable accomplishment. But none of those goals were Robin's. They just simply showed up as a byproduct of her love. Which brings us back to Tina. What's love got to do with it? Well, if you ask me, everything. How about everything? Of all the lessons that I've learned, of all the things that I can take from my time, my accomplishments, as an Olympian, as an author, as an entrepreneur, as a coach, as a teacher, the one thing that stands above every other lesson is that love outperforms grit every time, every time. 